the projects that have high neodymium are arguably going to be most attractive to the industry and uh, and hopefully most attractive to the market. And in that regard, the Ashram Rare Earth Element Project has one of the highest distributions of the four rare earth elements I just mentioned. Well, hello to viewers tuning in. We're catching up with Commerce Resources today about their rare earth metals exploration and development projects in Canada. And I'm pleased to be speaking with Chris Grove, President and Director of Commerce. Chris, great to be speaking with you again. Great to speak with you again, Adam. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for taking time today. So um, why don't we set the scene actually uh, with what's going on in the rare earth market? Because last time we spoke in the spring, um, there was an interesting uh, development in, in the sector. But as far as I understand, uh, things have moved on and things have changed. So let's start on the macro factors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very happy to do that. And uh, ultimately, uh, what has changed significantly in terms of the global rare earth element market. The last time we spoke, which was in May, um, that would have been essentially in Q2 of 2021. And uh, demand was reported as being down and prices were reported as being uh, significantly down. But uh, this is essentially because everyone that actually buys and needs rare earth elements to manufacture their own specific designs, uh, they had essentially overbought in Q1 of 2021. Um, everybody who needs rare earth elements to build their products uh, uh, are, I would say, a hyper price sensitive to uh, price movement in the rare earth element sector. And for a potential variety of reasons, prices started spiking up late in Q4 2020, and then continued a quite a spectacular price uh, ascendancy, let's call it, in Q1 of 2021. Everyone in the sector, majors and juniors, hit their 52-week high in Q1 of 2021. And again, arguably, everyone that has to buy rare earth elements uh, potentially saw this price movement uh, and essentially, I, I don't want to call it panic per se, but essentially they overbought and that buying uh, potentially pushed prices up to a high watermark. Um, and then there was very little buying and prices then <laughs> fell in Q2. Now, uh, the reality of those falling prices and the lack of per, uh, the perception of the lack of demand in Q2 then led to everyone falling off uh, their 52 week highs. And this is all majors and all juniors. And no one yet has really recovered. But here's the point. The point is, is that rare earth element prices started appreciating basically in early June of 2021, and they're currently almost as high as they were in Q1. And uh, there is this, at the moment, there is a bit more of a disconnect between the actual values and the actual continued expression of demand in rare earth elements, and then uh, the market caps of all of the companies involved in rare earth elements today. Uh, no one, as far as I know, has actually bested their 52-week high in 2021 right now, although, as I said, the rare earth element prices are basically as high as they were in Q1. And we're talking about a very significant uh, uh, level of prices as well. We're talking about $98,000 per ton of neodymium oxide, for an example. And uh, that's a very, very attractive price, I would say, for any uh, explorer or developer. Uh, maybe less so for somebody who's buying neodymium oxide because uh, that price is fairly high. But at any rate, this then leads me to another macro point. And there's a fund based out of Geneva and their analyst uh, goes by the name of Laurent Kroll. And uh, uh, this fund uh, puts out their investment strategy on a regular basis. And I was very uh, much impressed by some language that Laurent had in the most recent investment strategy, uh, which I think came from September 2nd, I believe. But at any rate, he talked about the macros of rare earth element prices globally over the last decade. And what he referenced first off was the uh, Senkaku boat incident in the fall of 2010, which created very clearly, as he called it, a supply shock. And that is very accurate in so much 
as China cut off all supplies to Japan for about six to eight weeks. And the market globally reacted uh, very significantly to that. And uh, some of the rare earth elements went up as much as 30 times in price. Dysprosium oxide going from $90 a kilo to $3,000 a kilo in a matter of months. At any rate, Laurent then said, uh, 2021 in the future is going to be different because what we should expect is a demand shock. And this I find very, very compelling and potentially profound, but also accurate in so much as in the summer of 2021 with these incredible uh, 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 climate events, weather events happening, wildfires all you know through North America, et cetera, Greece, et cetera, um, you know, uh, uh, hurricanes, uh, you know, Henri, Ida on the east coast of the of North America, et cetera. Th these events potentially have drawn everyone's focus, and there's probably more agreement now in September 21. Uh, 2021 that you know climate change is real and everyone needs to do more uh, to, to uh, 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 positively uh, affect climate change. And in that regard, we may be looking you know right at the crosshairs of a pivot point in terms of uh, electric vehicle uh, adoption. And so um, I, I think that's it's very likely that we will see a, a very significant increase in demand, or as this fund manager said, a demand shock in the rare earth element sector. Now, having said that, uh, since we spoke, there has been little that has changed in terms of production or new production in the rare earth elements. And so, you know, to me, this, this potential for uh, um, increased, uh, an expression of increased demand and also potentially higher prices is very likely indeed. Excellent, thanks for that rundown. It's, um, it's a really compelling situation for rare earths again. Um, just touching on what you said around the uh, EV adoptions um, and some of the rare earths that will be going into this growth sector. Um, what, what exactly are they? And, and um, is it fluorospar that sort of goes into um, the production of certain materials and metals that are going into EVs? Well, the, the most important rare earth elements for uh, the EV market are the four rare earth elements that are used to manufacture the permanent magnets that essentially chase each other in the, uh, uh, in the motor in, uh, for electric vehicles. And really any, uh, if, if you've, if you own a, a Dyson vacuum cleaner or, a, you know, dried your hands in a Dyson uh, hand dryer or uh, you've bought a leaf blower recently, you will recognize the power of these rare earth element magnets chasing each other, which is amazing. And uh, so the four rare earth elements that are most essential for the clean, glean, clean, green, and renewable word, uh, world are neodymium, praseodymium, terbium, and dysprosium. And the most important of those four is neodymium. And so uh, the projects that have high neodymium are arguably going to be most attractive to the industry and, uh, and hopefully most attractive to the market. And in that regard, the Ashram Rare Earth Element Project has one of the highest distributions of the four rare earth elements I just mentioned. In terms of fluorospar, you know, that's, that's a separate issue. Uh, fluorospar, of course, is not a rare earth element, but fluorospar is uh, an essential component of the lithium ion battery that then is currently the dominant design for electric vehicles as well. Um, there is other, you know, in, in, in terms of the, the, the battery for electric vehicles though, you know, this is an ongoing R&D project and uh, we are for our own selfish purposes, very interested in a different design, which is the Toshiba titanium niobium battery. And uh, it's unclear at this point in time, uh, which design will actually dominate. And uh, certainly the Toshiba battery has been called by some analysts, experts in the battery field, uh, it, they have called it potentially the superior design in, in so much as it can be recharged fully in less than six minutes. So, uh, you know, it's a wait and see situation there. But uh, fluorospar is essential for the lithium ion battery. Uh, we're certainly happy to talk about our fluorospar byproduct at the ashram as it is the world's second largest defined fluorospar resource. 
Um, I hope that answered your question now. Yeah, certainly it did. And um, it's interesting because, yes, of course, EVs uh, and the lithium-ion battery chemistry is constantly evolving um, and great deal of change um, as there's a lot of um, input to find the optimum uh, battery chemistry for the market that it's presenting. But let's let's delve into the Ashram project then, because that's where the, the news really is at the moment. And it's some really exciting updates that you can give us on the, um, the, um, the mineral, metal, the metallurgical work there, of course. Um, you've done some sample testing and it's come back with some, some great news. Uh, could you tell us about the process of uh, recovering and testing the, the mineral concentrate there? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we have been focusing uh, for, you know, the last year or so on producing uh, commercially marketable samples of both of our commodities, uh, acid grade fluorospar, which we produced and delivered in December of last year to an industry processor uh, or an ind industry major, I should say. And then also we produced uh, our first commercially marketable sample of a rare earth element concentrate and delivered that to an industry street processor in March of this year, as we would have talked about uh, previously. Uh, currently, uh, we are working on a set of samples for another group of industry processors. And really the fundamental difference between the sample we produced in March of this year and this current set of samples is that this current set of samples will be completely thorium free. And so technically it will be a chemical concentrate, whereas the concentrate we produced and delivered in March of this year, that was then a mineral concentrate, which still had the very low level of thorium that is naturally occurring in the ashram deposit, still in the concentrate. Um, however, that thorium uh, is one of the things that is being removed right now from this current set of samples because this current set of processors cannot accept any radioactive elements. Um, while we're on this point of the norms, which is stands for naturally occurring radioactive materials, I should mention that the ashram benefits from having essentially no uranium and a very low level of thorium. And as Canada was historically the world's largest uranium producer and is now the world's second largest uranium producer, all of the protocols and policies are well in place uh, so that it is not specifically an issue for us to have a low level of thorium in the deposit and then to process that out in Quebec or in another location in North America. It's really when you get into international shipment and international processors that uh, those are the companies that cannot accept anything, any concentrate with a radioactive uh, material in it. And so to be very clear, that's the kind of samples we're working on right now. Uh, we're very happy with the work that is being done on these samples at Hazen Research in Golden, Colorado. And at the same time, we're working on the optimization of the process flow sheet, uh, which will then be included in the pre-feasibility study in 2022. Uh, we had a news release out recently, and essentially this detailed uh, the highest percentage uh, uh, mineral concentrate we have produced with the highest percentage uh, 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 of neodymium and uh, praseodymium, which we were very happy about. Mm. Fantastic. And, and so like these high, high percentages obviously change the requirements downstream in terms of the amount of processing um, and additional cost that you can uh, that you need to to get the end product if, if I'm if I'm along the right lines here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, it, it is this kind of optimization of the front end of the process flow sheet that, as you have just said, uh, essentially reduces downstream costs, improves uh, performance, uh, potentially improves you know, the economics for the process flow sheet as well, which we're already basically uh, 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 we're all, we're extremely good. I mean, uh, our preliminary economic assessment nine years ago uh, detailed a very early attempt at processing, which although it was positive and the economics were very positive in the PEA, we have optimized those ones very significantly since that time over the last nine years. And the most recent set of results are excellent for sure. 
Great. Uh, so what needs to happen next with regards to the testing process? You know, mentioned the pre-feasibility study. Um, is there a date for when that's going to conclude? Do you need to get a certain amount of tests back before you can sign off on that? Well, we're hopeful to have the pre-feasibility study completed uh, within the first two quarters of 2022. Uh, but at this juncture, I should mention that as essentially a reaction uh, or uh, something related to COVID is that everyone that could and that had the financial wherewithal to do work, uh, field work in 2021 did so as we did and uh, because of you know, COVID-19 restrictions in 2020, which was uh, definitely the case for us. Uh, we didn't get, uh, or COVID restrictions weren't lifted uh, in Nunavik where the ashram is located until May of this year. And mm -hmm. so we drilled uh, approximately 2,800 meters on the ashram and uh, so many other companies uh, drilled exponentially more this year than they did last year. And so that, has led to a backlog uh, at all of the assay labs. And so in terms of answering your question about the delivery of the pre-feasibility study, uh, I do have to also recognize that there is currently a backlog at all of the assay labs, which also affects all of the check assays that are done for every part of the process uh, in our pilot plant as well. So we, uh, we are still hopeful uh, to be able to deliver on that timeline. But again, this backlog is something that we're uh, challenged with right at the moment. Yeah, understandable. And this is quite um, an industry-wide challenge at the moment. Um, how are things on the ground, though, aside from just the assaying? Is it, you know, um, in terms of operating in Quebec? Um, are, are other things um, held up, mobility, or are things sort of resumed a degree of normality now? Um, it's busy. You know, that's the main thing. You know, we had a very, uh, very uh, good uh, drill operator on site. We were very happy with uh, their work. Uh, they were fast. They were professional. Uh, we ended up doing uh, more meters than we had hoped for. And they also came in uh, under budget. Uh, and so we were very happy with them. Um, but everything in uh, Quebec, and I'm sure this is, is the same for any jurisdiction, I mean, it was tough at a certain point to find a second helicopter, for example, because everybody is so busy. Uh, but everything basically on the ground, in the camp, uh, is good. Our camp is still open, and uh, we are doing other aspects, uh, environmental uh, baseline data collection, et cetera, et cetera, which will also be factored in and required by the pre-feasibility study. Mm. Excellent. Okay. Um, just turning to your other projects then, um, you've got some other exploration going on at the uh, Upper Fear uh, deposit in BC. Uh, could you talk us through um, any updates there since we last spoke? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, in terms of the Upper Fur Tantalum and Niobium project uh, here in British Columbia, uh, we released uh, positive economics on that in November of 2011. Uh, we did uh, some additional uh, drilling uh, added to the resource, uh, some additional metallurgical work on the project over the next several years. Uh, there was an update uh, to the PEA released in 2015, uh, but the really interesting thing is, besides the fact that you know we have a defined resource of approximately 54 million tons indicated and inferred combined, and I can break that down certainly, uh, but ultimately uh, uh, the, the the resource is significant at our uh, upper fur project in terms of the world of tantalum exploration, but uh, the interesting interesting thing is, is that the dominant source of tantalum globally uh, for the last decade or so has been Central Africa, and it has been the countries of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. But these are very different styles of deposits. They're essentially alluvial, and they really only are effectively artisanally mined, which means mined by hand, essentially, 
uh, because of the hundreds of millions of years of weathering of the host rock. Uh, the tantalum bearing minerals themselves are very, very, very resist resistant to weathering. And so you end up with a, uh, a concentration of tantalum bearing minerals at or near surface, but they're not disseminated at depth as is our uh, deposits under our Blue River uh, set of claims here in British Columbia. So uh, production amounts, uh, it had been reported, have been falling in Central Africa for, for several years now. In addition, and this is a somewhat sensitive point, but uh, the, the, the current status of industry majors in terms of ESG seems to have risen to the near the top of the list of priorities for, uh, uh, the, the, for management of many global uh, majors. And so what is not necessarily clear is how much of that production coming out of Central Africa actually abides by the worker health and safety uh, uh, um, uh, requirements uh, set by the OECD. And there is an argument that most of that production is conflict production. And so in terms of these two forces, uh, falling production amounts from Central Africa, and also increased anxiety over a major's position in terms of ESG, that has led to what I would say is a significant increase of industry interest in our upper fur project. And we're very happy about that. And uh, we are certainly considering looking at doing a, a project update uh, on the project using uh, current values of tantalum and niobium oxide. So uh, that is something that we are looking to uh, do this fall, and uh, we'll certainly be happy to update you on that. And I should uh, just make it clear before we leave, if I may, Absolutely. that uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the mineral resource uh, for the Upper Fur Project, uh, as it is required to state, um, it is 48 million tons in the indicated category and 5.4 million tons in the inferred category. Uh, these are uh, specific requirements uh, by the regulators here to make uh, these statements known so that investors understand what percentage is in the higher resource category, which in this case is indicated over inferred. And so uh, I, I didn't want to be uh, in error in uh, presenting the full description of that resource. Excellent. Uh, that's very good. Um, so thanks very much, for that, Chris. Um, just wanted to touch quickly on the company financials while we have time in terms of um, how you're funded for the next uh, phases of testing and drilling and that bit of exploration. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, at this point in time, uh, in the last uh, nine, 10 months, we've raised just a hair under $8 million. And so uh, uh, we have a, a good amount of that capital left. Uh, you know, all of these programs are very expensive, but uh, at this point in time, we are not uh, envisioning uh, a private placement. Um, and certainly, you know, to circle back to what I believe is one of the most important things for the companies, for the company is the production of this next set of samples to industry majors uh, with the hope that one of these majors might uh, find it attractive to partner with us on the ashram deposit uh, through a project level investment based upon a sale of percent uh, a percentage sale of future offtake or perhaps a percentage sale of the deposit itself uh, i.e a non-dilutive financing and so um, considering the proximity of the completion of these samples we uh, are optimistic that that might be the case to secure uh, the, the outstanding amount of capital we would need to uh, finish the pre-feasibility study, uh, the environmental social impact assessment and the bankable feasibility study. Yeah, excellent. So a lot hinging on these samples coming back with uh, the positive results, but it looks like everything is very much on track so far and, and showing really good um, metallurgy from what you've discovered so far. Chris, thanks very much for updating us on the projects and we look forward to catching up again on SA TV later in the year to hear more about how the samples will come back. Okay, great. My pleasure. Thank you.